We're reading from the book of the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 17. And we'll read from verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, But now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, Some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to us. Let's turn to uh, Mark's Gospel in chapter 6, a passage we read and looked at last week, uh, but reading from verse 6, Mark 6 and verse 6. He marveled because of their unbelief, and then he went about the villages in a circuit, teaching. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Also he said to them, In whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Well, as we saw last uh, Sunday, um, the Lord returned for a second time to speak in his hometown of Nazareth, uh, and his ministry on that occasion was comprehensively uh, rejected, and he was ostracized, so much so that even he was amazed at the congregation's lack of faith. But do you remember what his reaction was to that that we read just a moment ago? Then Jesus sulked. No. Then Jesus decided he'd go back to being a carpenter, 
No. Then Jesus entered a great sense of depression that he never got over. No, not at all. This is what we read. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus went around teaching from village to village. He told him, verse 6, Their opposition didn't prevent the Lord Jesus from continuing his ministry. A few years ago, um, an organization here in Wales decided that uh, the pastors of Wales needed to be cheered up, that we were all depressed. And so a man was employed full-time to travel around pastors, helping to cheer them up. What an odd picture of preachers that presents. You can't help imagining, can you, all these pastors sitting immersed in self-pity and asking why life is so difficult for them as, as you go about your daily work. Well, far be it from me to belittle at all some of the difficulties that some pastors have to face today, but the New Testament tells me that they are to be soldiers of Jesus Christ and they are to be prepared to endure hardness. They are men to whom Jesus says, Blessed are you when all men despise you. And to those men apply all God's promises for strength and grace and comfort and peace. The Lord Jesus walked away from that local rejection and he just got on with teaching the word of God everywhere else. Uh, This was the Savior's third preaching tour. The opposition and hostility at Nazareth didn't tempt him for a moment to think of perhaps only giving a silent, loving witness that that was sufficient, that it would be enough for him by the integrity of his daily life uh, to show that he knew God. A godly walk, of course, is indispensable. We know that. It's vital that we live credible and godly lives uh, before our neighbors and our friends. But more than that is needed to make a Christian More than kindness is necessary. A person needs to hear the word of God explain the grace that they see in a believer. So it wasn't enough for the Lord Jesus to live silently in Nazareth for 25 years uh, and to grow in favor with the people there, as the Scripture teaches us. The people of Nazareth needed a clear and a precise word uh, concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he was, why he came into the world. And without that illumination, they would lack understanding. And without the word of God, they could not come to a full commitment, a discerning commitment. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So we're told Jesus went around preaching and teaching from village to village. But now his ministry develops and it spreads in a very significant way. One day we're told the Lord Jesus calls his disciples to him, the twelve, because the time had come for them to be given new responsibilities. They were going to become preachers. And we read there in verse 7, he sent them out two by two. The Lord had called them, first four fishermen, then a tax collector, Levi, and then the other seven. And he said that they would become fishers of men, and he's already been teaching them now for months And he judges them ready to be given this commission and to be sent. And of course, there was a great deal of immaturity and imperfection in these men still. They were untried. They had only a limited grasp at this point of who Christ was. They had a very poor understanding of themselves, as we find as we read the Gospels. They'd never preached a gospel. Uh, They'd never preached a sermon. But the spread of the gospel, you see doesn't depend at all upon the perfection or the merit of the preachers, but on the call of Christ and obedience to that call and the equipping of Christ for that ministry. And because that's so, well, God could use a grumbling and disobedient man like Jonah so that through his messages, Nineveh was changed because Jonah told them the words that God had given him. And of course, disciples mustn't teach error and the more truth and godliness that they have themselves uh, the, the better but there's one thing that's paramount in all of this and it is this what Christ says the preacher says that must be the case when he says stop they must stop when he tells them to do something they must do it And they must be continually looking to him that his promises be fulfilled as they serve him 
day by day. They must trust and obey Jesus. And the instructions then that the Lord Jesus gives his disciples on this occasion are are very interesting and they're very relevant uh, to the church today. He tells them here how they were to go out. Josephus, the first century Jewish uh, historian, tells us that there were at this time 204 towns and villages in Galilee. So if the Lord sends out his disciples in pairs, and six pairs of disciples visit each town for about a week, that would mean that this outreach would last for around nine months. And we know that it's a very successful mission because many of the people they spoke to welcomed the message and began to follow the disciples back to the Lord Jesus. We're told in verse 30 and 31 of the chapter that the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And then because so many people were coming and going, they didn't have chance to eat. So the twelve had no time to themselves. The crowds were pressing in and wanting to know more and to hear more. They The disciples couldn't even sit down for a meal, we're told here. They attracted 5,000 people to Jesus, we're told in verse 44. And when they sailed across the Sea of Galilee to get away from the crowds, for a time they were completely unsuccessful because the crowd just hurried around the lake and they were waiting for them as their boat came to shore the other side. That was the impact of nine months of the ministry of these 12 men in those 204 communities of of Galilee. Now, if you look at the Lord Jesus sending them here, two things stand out particularly. He sent them out two by two, we read. That was the universal practice. Deuteronomy chapter 27 tells us that to bear trustworthy witness, two people must confirm the truth. And they were telling the people that the one John the Baptist had proclaimed and spoken about as coming, that he had arrived. Jesus of Nazareth, he healed the sick. Uh, There was no one whom he failed to restore to health. And in every town and in every village of Galilee, two witnesses stood up, preachers speaking to the people and testifying to the truth of these things. Two witnesses who would give names and places and dates and diseases and facts and figures. You see, Christianity is grounded upon history. They could answer questions about this with one heart and voice, and they proceeded to tell the people the great teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and to urge their hearers to repent and to believe. They weren't shifty, unreliable men with tall tales who were out for their money. They were upright men speaking as witnesses of the truth of all that they had seen and heard that was done and said by Jesus. And the Lord Jesus sent them out in pairs for mutual encouragement also and to support one another. Because the fact is that it's much easier to speak boldly if there's another Christian listening. There's less danger of toning down the message out of fear and a greater encouragement to tell things as they are. That's because we're weak men, the best of us. We're told here that Jesus sent them out in pairs. John the Baptist did the same, we read in Luke 7. And so did the early church in the book of Acts. So that's the principle to follow. Even our Savior chose 12 to be with him, and then three to be at his side at his neediest times. Jesus sends them in twos. And, uh, and then we can see this, that the Lord gives them authority over evil spirits, we're told. They went out, verse 12, and, went and preached that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Uh, Jesus gave them authority over evil spirits. A preacher's only authority is the authority of the one who sends him. So we read here, he gave them authority over evil spirits. So there's no no doubt that such evil spirits exist, and they were particularly active during the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus. His ministry was never a ministry of word only. It was always word and deed. It was a demonstration that God's kingdom was 
breaking in. Mark constantly refers to that fact in his account of the life of Jesus. He takes us, he takes pains to show us that the works of Jesus, his miracles, confirm his claims to be judge of all the earth, to be the resurrection and the life, to have existed before Abraham, to be the way and the truth and the life, to be one with the Father and so on. His miracles were signs that attested the truth of his words. And now Jesus gives this authority to the twelve, we're told in verse 7, authority to cast out evil spirits, evil spirits which in an extraordinary way, as never before and never since the earth's, the Lord's earthly ministry, uh, were given power to possess men and women uh, and to oppose the work of Christ. So do you see the scene that's being set for us here in chapter 6? The disciples entered those towns and villages in twos. They preached to the community, and then often men and, and women who had been possessed by evil spirits came agitated and crying out. Their lives had been ruined by the work of the devil, and the disciples with authority given to them by Jesus Christ and empowered by him uh, delivered these people. And those exorcisms then had a great impact on those communities. And other sick people were brought to them, and the two preachers would anoint them with oil, and uh, we're told that there were many who were healed, verse 13. So these authenticating signs meant that the people would pay attention to the teaching of the Twelve. The same signs would silence skeptics and gainsayers. Now, gospel preachers today lack nothing of the authority of those first disciples. You might doubt that that is the case, but there is a miraculous confirmation given to me every time I speak to you, and that is the presence in our midst of a word that comes to us from another world. It is a God-breathed book, the Bible, so that it is exactly what God intended Moses and the prophets and the apostles to write. Its words are spirit and truth and life. They are words that will last longer than the universe in which we live. I'm talking about the Bible, which is the word of God, and it confirms that what I'm saying to you is true. You can check out whether I'm preaching the truth. I simply appeal to this amazing book, the Bible. Read it. Read it. See for yourself that what I'm saying is found in the pages of Scripture. Countless thousands have read this book and found with growing conviction and love that they are persuaded that it is God's own message to the world. Very few people have read this book seriously, thoughtfully, prayerfully for two years and not been converted. It is God's message to the world. Now, the Twelve, of course, didn't have a scrap of the New Testament, did they? They had none of it written that they might give it to the people in the villages of Galilee. The New Testament wasn't to be completed for at least another 40 years. But the, in the meantime, God confirmed the truth of the apostolic preaching by apostolic signs, the casting out of demons and the healing of the sick by anointing them with oil. So they went out in twos and they were given authority over evil spirits and over sickness. But notice what they were to take in verse 8. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belt, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. They weren't angels. They were men, so they needed clothes, sandals, and a staff as protection against wild animals. But they weren't to take a change of clothes, no food for the journey, no knapsack, no money. Why those meticulous instructions? And I think there is a number of strands to the teaching of Jesus at this point. For example, those four items, cloak, belt, sandal, staff, those are the very things that God commanded the Israelites to take when they went on their flight from Egypt at Passover. And in referring to those particular things, I think it's likely that the Lord Jesus 
is impressing upon these disciples the urgency of their mission, that they were living in days when the axe was being laid to the root of the tree of Israel. The old covenant days were numbered. Jerusalem was going to be a place to escape from. Israel's days were numbered, and they had to work while it was day, and the night comes when no man can work in the work of the kingdom of God, live as free from encumbrances as Israel did when they set out from Egypt for Canaan. That's what he's saying to them. You are to be sojourners and pilgrims in the earth. That's what he's saying to his disciples there, I think. They were dangerous times. In the next section of this chapter, Mark goes on to speak of the murder of John the Baptist for preaching the coming kingdom. So there was a sense of coming judgment and the need to escape. They were to travel lightly. And not only that, but we find in Scripture that when a man entered the temple courts, he had to put off staff and shoes and money belts. In other words, it's saying that the ordinary things of life were to be set aside. And it may be that what Jesus is speaking about here is that he's also thinking that he wants the disciples see that when they go into humble homes in Galilee, they were entering into places every bit as sacred in God's eyes as the temple itself. Maybe this is a foretaste of the priesthood of all believers, and the ending of any kind of geographical holy places, that every place was going to be a holy place when they brought the gospel to that place. And they're being taught, aren't they, from the very beginning of their ministries, that the Lord who commands also provides. Depending on the one who sends, we lack nothing to accomplish our mission and are fully equipped for our calling. And we need to be learning that lesson constantly, don't we, as the Lord's people and as we mature. God has ways of testing us and letting us experience that great reality for ourselves. The twelve all lived in Galilee. Uh, They were all about a day or two's walking distance from their home. So they had the security of falling back on that in the back of their minds, no doubt. If things went wrong, they could always go home. But they never needed to go home. The first mission was a gentle introduction for them to their future life of far greater rigor and suffering, preaching the gospel all over Israel and throughout the eastern Mediterranean, looking to the Lord to provide for them day by day. They had to go out depending on the Lord, just as the birds of the air live in confidence on a creator who supplies their needs day by day. So the disciples weren't to think in terms of elaborate support systems with, with structures that some preachers all seem to think is so vital today, with provision for every eventuality guaranteed to them. If If all of that is always to be in place for us, well, how will we ever come to a point where we serve God in faith? If preachers are not trusting the Lord to provide for them, how can they tell a congregation, you've just got to trust him. That's all you have to do, and he'll save you and keep you and supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. These men, these preachers have to learn that themselves also. So in a very simple way, I think the Lord Jesus is encouraging his people to think in terms of the simplicity of the way in which the gospel is spread in the world. Our Lord's approach isn't to get a million men to march on Jerusalem or to get 10 million men to march on Rome to speak with the emperor. It's just 12 men going out in six pairs and depending on God to provide for them. I think the church needs to relearn that lesson of living in dependence on God's provision for the work. And notice what they're to do, verse 10 and 11. He also said to them, In whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. The Lord Jesus contrasts two situations there, doesn't he? The first is a a village in which these two Christian preachers are, are welcomed. 
They are to stay in the same house during the time they're there. No one's ever tempted to move, are they, to a worse place, to a poorer dwelling. So if the disciples move after a few days, it's more than likely they're going to be going to a richer home. And by doing that, they would be saying that material things really didn't matter to them. A move from one home to another would undermine the message that they were sent to preach, and they would be dishonoring their host. They were not there on a social visit, staying one night with a family and then the next with another, and so on. They were in the village to serve the king of kings, and they weren't there on a holiday. So they weren't to give people the opportunity to talk about their taste in homes and food. Uh, which they would if they were moving from place to place, day by day, night by night. Their whole life was to reflect um, Christ and his message that people need to repent. They were serious days, and it was a serious mission, and their lifestyle had to reflect their deepest convictions as servants of God. And then this contrasting situation is of a village where the two men are rejected. You and your preaching are not welcome here, they would be told. We don't want to listen to you. And now take your anointing oil and your exorcisms and get out of here. How would they respond to that? Well, they weren't to be overwhelmed with guilt. They weren't to cry and to say to each other, well, it's all our own fault. If only we'd been more loving. If only we'd been better preachers. And if only we'd perform more healings and more exorcisms, then there would have been a revival. That was not the response that they were to give. They were to shake the dust from their feet as they left. What does that mean? It's saying, it was saying to, to that town, we are not going to be contaminated with your unbelief. You've heard the gospel and you've dismissed it. Many others have never heard it, So we will go immediately to them. There's no time to waste. You've missed your opportunity. We're going, and we won't be back. There are examples all through the Bible of that. There was a time in the Old Testament history when the nation, uh, the 12 tribes, were divided, and Jeroboam became the the king of Israel, uh, the tribes in the north, and he didn't want the Jews amongst his people going down to the feasts at Jerusalem, Uh, there at the temple and uh, so he rejected the temple and he rejected temple worship and the priests who served there and he substituted his own priests his own clergy and he built two temples in the north with idols images of a golden calf and a golden goat what did the priests and levites do they brushed the dust off their feet And they moved to Judah. We read about it in 2 Chronicles and chapter 11. From all their territories, the priests and the Levites who were in all Israel took their stand with him. For the Levites left their common lands and their possessions and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had rejected them from serving as priests to the Lord. Then he appointed for himself priests for the high places, for the demons and the calf idols which he had made. And after the Levites left, those from all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong for three years, because they walked in the way of David and Solomon for three years. The godly in the whole northern kingdom walked away. They quit Israel and they moved south to Judah to worship there. There was no way that the people of God could continue to worship together under those circumstances. The faithful of the northern kingdom didn't say, well, we mustn't be too narrow-minded. We mustn't say that there's only one truth and only one way to God. Not at all. When people began to make sacrifices to golden calves and goats, they brushed the the dust from their feet and they left. They headed for a place where the Lord's name was being honored. That's what they did. And that's what the Lord Jesus says the disciples here are to do. 
It was about five or six years ago that the Anglican Synod in Vancouver, uh, Bishop Ingram announced that he was going to bless same-sex marriages in Vancouver. The evangelicals there, led by Dr. Jim Packer, protested, but when the Synod expressed their determination to support the bishop, J.I. Packer at last walked. He and his supporters walked out of the Synod. They shook the dust from their feet repudiating that ungodly decision. You find exactly the same thing in the New Testament. Paul and Barnabas take the gospel into Pisidian Antioch. They speak in the synagogue. And many of the Jews are persuaded to follow them. But others are jealous. They spoke against Paul and, and uh, what he was saying. And we read this. And then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, But since you rejected and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. And they shook the dust off their feet and moved on. They turned away from an unbelieving people who refused to trust in Christ because there were others who would listen. And they go to them. And what that is telling us is that we're under no obligation to go on trying to speak to those who despise the message, who don't want to hear us. Love constrains us, doesn't it, to talk to our loved ones when we can. And what wisdom we need when we're doing that. But it's a fearful thing when a community, when a nation, when a continent is die-hard in its resistance to Jesus Christ. What hope can there be for a civilization like that? And we're to pray that it might not become like that in Europe. Though it does seem that's the way we're heading. Notice what they were to preach. The message, what was the message these pairs of men received from the Lord? That they were given authority to preach in village to village. We're told they went out and preached that people should repent. Verse 12. Now just imagine this. God has sent his only son from heaven. All the way from heaven. And he has brought into this world the very words that God would have this world here. To teach the world. And what is this divine and heavenly message? You must repent. That's it. You must repent. There's nothing particularly profound about that message, is there? Anyone can understand what repentance means. Two disciples would go into a village and they would speak about a king having come from heaven, Jesus the Messiah, and that they were his servants and he had sent them with a message to give to these villagers. The king was sending a message to all the people of Galilee that God was angry with the way that they were living their lives and his wrath was hanging over them and it was about to burst upon them. And he was telling them that they didn't love him nor did they love their neighbours as they should, that they were liars and cheats and child abusers and womanizers and thieves and drunkards and proud and cruel men and women and they must repent and that they must do it now. It wasn't that they had to understand what repentance was, but they had to put into practice repentance there and then. They had to turn from their sins, and there had to be this profound, life-changing turnaround, if it were genuine, in God-given repentance. And it would mean not just their heads turning in a different direction, but their body, their feet, so that from now on their entire life would be going in a new way. That's God's command to these Galilean sinners. Turn from your sin and unbelief. Face God, and you will discover the wonders of his grace. That's what you've got to do. God has loved the world, given his only begotten Son, and repentance is turning from your sins and embracing the Son of God. Turn your back on your sins. These disciples were preaching and turn to God. That's what they said. Preach repentance, Jesus had told them. That's what they did. Do you understand that repentance is much more than just saying, I'm sorry for what, I, what I've done? The word repentance doesn't mean feel 
remorse. It basically means a change of mind. It doesn't mean different thinking about particular sins. It means different thing, thinking about yourself, that you have been going in the wrong direction. In other words, we think about ourselves and about sin in a different way. You no longer find sin irresistible. You no longer say, say about your precious sins, but they're lovely. No longer do you say that, that because you've had a radical change of heart and mind about it. That's what repentance is. It's like the people of Romania those years ago learning the truth about their president, Nicolae Ceausescu. Once he was the great leader and there were statues of him everywhere. But now they've seen the torture cells and now they know about the cruelty and the mass graves and the thousands who's, who disappeared and the utterly unrestrained, vulgar excesses of his wealth. While they were living in poverty all those years and they took Ceausescu and they got rid of him. They see him in a different light now. Their eyes have been opened and they hate all that he stood for. That's what gospel repentance is like. When you look at your own sins, you hate them. Now I see myself as God sees me and I have no excuse for myself. That's what repentance is. It's not just some kind of general interest in Christianity. It's not being mildly concerned about your soul and about the things of God. It's coming to see that before God you are helpless and hopeless and you are utterly doomed because of your sins. And unless he has mercy upon you, you are eternally condemned for them. And it's seeing that so clearly that all you can do is cry out to him, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And any preacher who sees that should have the sense to step out of God's way so that Jesus Christ can give to his people true gospel repentance. And they're not scared that their hearers might go out one Sunday night and get knocked down by a bus before they get saved. They believe God and God's grace does the work. And they won't get as many converts that way, I know. But the ones they do will be real and not just numbers. God gives gospel repentance. So we see what Jesus tells his disciples here, the twelve. He commands every one of you to repent of your own sins. You've got to change your mind about your life and about God and about how it is between you and God. You must repent. It's too hard, you might say. I'm too old, you might say. I'm not strong enough. Well, Christ can give that repentance. And you have to cry to God, and he will give you that gift. You won't be happy, you see, with mere remorse. You have to cry to God. He demands a profound change of attitude to all these things. You know, the twelve couldn't save any of those sinners. They didn't have that ability, and neither do I. Sinners are saved only by grace, the grace of God. But I can live simply, and I can trust God's provision, and I'm confident that God will give to some of you true repentance because his word does not return to him void, and then I'll see a great change. I've seen God call others, like Lazarus, whom he called out of his grave. I've seen God call many others out of the tomb of unbelief. Hear his voice tonight as he calls you.